Hey, I'll just uh, quickly say something. So welcome to this session. Um, first one of the afternoon sessions, we have two half an hour sessions. Um, so what we'll do, um, or what the presenters want to do is take about 20 minutes to talk and then 10 minutes for questions right after each of the sessions. Um, is everybody um, happy with the session to be recorded? Yes, just to double check. Um, great. Um, and yeah, I think I'll give it to you. Uh, away to you, Igor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Igor Lesko. I come originally from Slovakia, but I've been living for the past, what, 22 years in South Africa, and that's where I'm coming from for this particular conference. Uh, I'm from Open Education Global, uh, which is an international member-based organization dedicated to opening up education worldwide. And on that note, I think I'm compelled to say that I hope to see many of you at the Open Education Global Conference in Edmonton in October this year. Uh, but today, I'm also wearing a different hat. I'm also a PhD candidate and a member of the Global OER Graduate Network. The Global OER Graduate Network is a network of PhD researchers working on different topics related to open education, uh, policies included. We have back here in the audience as well, who is part of the management team. If you want to know more, please speak to after the session. And uh, today, this presentation is part of a bigger PhD research study or research that I've been working on for some time now exploring how international organizations have influenced the development of governmental OER policies from 2002 until 2019. The goal of this particular presentation today is to provide an overview of the OER policy instruments that were used by four intergovernmental organizations uh, to influence the development of governmental OER policies, highlight the similarities and differences in their approaches, and then also report on their perceived or observed successes and challenges with their efforts. I already said what the main research question was. Um, so I, obviously I've, I've carried out a literature review, uh, but more importantly, what's interesting for you to know is that I uh, conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with international organizations and also with uh, governmental policy makers and advisors and experts in different countries, right? So the, the data collection process was, stru was structured into two different phases. The first phase involved international organizations and that included all together um, these players, uh, so in different groups, so intergovernmental organizations, the four of them, UNESCO, OECD, Commonwealth of Learning and the European Commissions, and four international non-governmental organizations or associations, which, which was Open Education Global, Creative Commons, OER Africa, and OER Asia, and then also foundations, which was Hewlett Foundation, Shuttleworth Foundation, and the Open Society Foundations. There was a rationale for including foundations as well, which is not something that I'm going to be speaking about right now, uh, but they are included nevertheless because of the activities in the space since 2002. During those, during the interviews uh, with international organizations, I mean, this uh, on average lasted about two hours, one and a half to two hours, uh, two, mem two respondents per organization. Um, I focused on the rationale, uh, so why they are actually planning to or why they're trying to support the development of government loyal policies as one of the lines of action. Uh, what kind of OER policy instruments they applied, um, and what are the sort of organizational priorities with respect to these, these instruments, what are the sort of collaboration patterns with other international organizations in the space, their perceived observed successes or challenges, and their future intentions. And because the OER policy instrument is a term that I use throughout the research, uh, just to give a little bit of a definition, so OER policy instruments, as far as they are defined for the MIND, PhD research are multiple mechanisms of influence by international organizations that can directly or indirectly affect government OER policy processes. And by government OER policy processes, I'm talking about the sort of policy cycle. So if you are thinking about agenda setting, policy formulation, adoption, implementation, and so on. Um, and these um, mechanisms of influence here are, are referring to discursive dissemination, standard setting, financial means, coordinative functions, and technical advice. And I will explain what that means in subsequent slides. So this is just to give an overview of the first phase of data collection. And briefly, I'm also going to tell you about the second phase of the data collection, so that you have got the most great picture about what I did in the research. So during the second phase, I've conducted interviews with governmental policymakers and advisors in 35 different countries, states, and provinces. These were close to, close to 40 interviews. It was 11 countries in Europe, 11 in Asia, four in Africa, four in Latin America and the Middle East, and then two in North America, which included the United States and Canada, three provinces in Canada, British Columbia, Alberta, and Ontario, 
and in the United, United States, it was um, Washington and California states and the Federal Department of Education. During these interviews, uh, the focus areas were on the government lawyer policies that were adopted in these respective countries um, and the perceived influence of international organizations on these policies that were adopted. Um, also, the perceived effectiveness of the policy instruments that are used by IOs in this regard. And also, like I was asking about the recommendations. So, in what way could IOs or international organizations support these processes more effectively? This is not what I'm going to be focusing on during today's presentation, but it's just to give an idea of what happened. All right, and just to kind of contextualize this within the literature or the theoretical underpinnings. This particular research is positioned within the literature that really examines the effect of globalization on, on educational policy processes. The main argument there is that public policy making is no longer confined within national boundaries. The policy makers are increasingly interconnected with a range of different actors beyond the nation state. So this could be international organizations or other policy networks. And then the, the, the policy text production is increasingly affected by globalized discourses and the process of globalization. And this is a phenomenon that is often referred to as a global education policy field or community. Now, researchers uh, did uh, lots of case studies in this area um, revealed that uh, international organizations affect higher education policy at global and national levels in different ways. So, for example, they engage in discursive, uh, discursive activities, they construct and disseminate ideas about higher education issues, um, they also assemble and maintain transnational policy networks, uh, they also sometimes prescribe policy directions, um, which can have uh, both binding or non-binding character for the states and their monitor compliance, uh, they provide funding, uh, they provide uh, direct or indirect policy or technical advice, or technical assistance as well. So there's a range of actions um, that IOs um, use to, to realize their intentions. And all of these that have uh, affect governmental educational policy processes, as, as I have already explained previously, gender setting, policy formulation or implementation. So overall, international organizations really have five main categories of policy instruments and then that they can adopt or apply to influence government lawyer policy processes. This would, this would include discursive dissemination, standard setting, financial means, coordinative functions, and technical assistance. Now I'm referring to this as, as I'm referring to them as OER policy instruments. This framework is based on the work of, of Jacobi and Sahanajan that I've also then adopted for my PhD research. Discursive dissemination in terms of activities, here you can think about again, these are I also call, uh, construct and disseminate ideas, right? Or call for support through their activities, which could include policy reports or, or proposals, various kinds of case studies or, or publications. They also organize conferences or, or meetings or networks. Uh, they also issue uh, policy communications, uh, which could be declarations or, or various kinds of statements. And I will provide some examples for each of those in subsequent slides in the finding slide. In the standard setting instrument, as I have uh, already mentioned, this, this includes conventions or recommendations, for example. I think that most of you here should be familiar with the UNESCO OER recommendation of 2019. Is there somebody who is not? Oh, oh okay. Um, so, so this is pretty much the only standard setting instrument uh, in, in relation to OER that was adopted by an IGO or intergovernmental organization. Then you've got financial means, um, and that's really uh, mostly provisioning of funding. Uh, the European Commission, for example, has been doing a lot of that. The coordinative functions, um, that's the monitoring of the policy compliance, and it's normally attached to standard setting instruments. So this can be both formal or informal monitoring procedures. So again, when we are thinking about the standard uh, US OER recommendation of 2019, um, the monitoring process there is related to the fact that the member states need to report on the progress with the implementation of the UNESCO OER recommendation every four to five years. And this process is currently ongoing because it's now, it's been more than four years now. Um, and then technical assistance, that's various capacity building activities uh, that IOs can engage in, uh, or they can also provide technical assistance in a sense of direct or indirect policy advice. So direct policy advice will be speaking to policymakers, uh, for example, provisioning of, of model policy documents and the like providing analytical advice 
indirect policy advice is typically incorporated within different types of publications that IOS produce. So in terms of results, right? Um, so again, just coming back to the original questions, like what kind of OER policy instruments um, the selected intergovernmental organizations applied uh, to influence the development of government OER policies. Um, the international activities in this space ranged from constructing and diffusing ideas about OER and related policies to providing funding, technical assistance, um, and then also adopting standard setting instruments. Uh, but in this particular case, that only refers to UNESCO. And just to give you some of the examples, so under discursive dissemination as one of the OER policy instrument category, um, the main focus there was on constructing and disseminating ideas about OER and related policies. Um, they also facilitated knowledge, exchange of knowledge and practices through various OER policy proposals and communications, publications, policy reports and advocacy. They also organized our international conferences, meetings, networks, fora of all kinds. Right? And just to give you an example, in terms of the policy proposals or communications, you can see the Paris OER Declaration of 2012, right? So that's a policy communication uh, under discursive dissemination. Or the regional forums that were organized uh, prior to, to in the period leading up to the actual adoption of the Paris OER Declaration. In 2013, it was the opening up education communication by the European Commission. Um, another example is the various surveys, guidelines, and publications that were done by these, by these IGOs, right, uh, collectively between 2010 and 2019 specifically. Technical assistance as another category of OER policy instruments uh, included the provisioning of indirect policy advice through publications and direct policy advice to governments and educational institutions, and then also capacity building activities and the provisioning of technical infrastructure. Uh, here, the, the example would be, for example, UNESCO and CO, following this policy communications um, from 2012, they engaged in a prominent sort of policy advice in different countries, and they often collaborated together in different countries. Um, the indirect policy advice was incorporated within different publications, you know, so for example, guidelines on the development of OER policies, which was issued in 2019, or the OECD in 2015 uh, issued the, or published another publication, OER Catalyst for Innovation, which has cut entire sections dedicated to policy. Uh, then you have got going open uh, policy recommendations on open education in Europe, uh, but uh, that was issued by the European Commission in 2017. Here I do I have to actually qualify, qualify that the European Commission is not just looking at OER, but they're looking at open education more broadly. And so in that context, not just about OER policies, but open education policies, of which OER is a component. This is just a snapshot of examples. Um, the range of instruments examples is, is pretty much uh, spans across like three or four <coughs> pages um, in, my, in, my, in my results, but it's just to give you an idea. Under financial means instruments, um, again, this includes providing funding for projects and initiatives, as example, here is the European Commission, the Erasmus Plus funding, which, is, which had a significant amount of money available for different initiatives related to OER. And as far as the standard setting and coordinated functions instruments are concerned, I'm not sure what's going on there. Is that okay? I think it's the UK University took like the same of Erasmus as you. <laughs> oh, oh. 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 Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the standard setting and coordinated functions instrument that includes again the UNESCO OER recommendation from 2019. So these are the examples of the OER policy instruments that the selected IGOs applied in, during this period to influence the development of government OER policies. In terms of similarities and differences between this between the policies of these IGOs, as you can see here. On the left-hand side, you can see the type of, of OER policy instruments, and, and going to the right, you can see like which IGO used which, which OER policy instruments. Right? So here you can really see that the selected IGOs collectively used all OER policy instrument categories, although like each IGO could not use all of them. Um, so again, for as an example, only UNESCO used a standard setting instrument in this, in this arena. Right? And those differences are dependent on the, the mandates of these organizations, the legal arrangements, organizational priorities, uh, which can be changing as well, right? So that's that's really dependent, context dependent for each. 
uh, and for example, I don't know, European Commission uh, does not really have a mandate to prescribe policy direction in the, in, in education. It has got the support competence. OECD rarely does this as well because they really focus on the power of persuasion, you know, so, uh, peer pressure uh, rather than prescribing policy directions. So, uh, in terms of the organizational priorities, as far as this, this selected OER or this identified OER policy instruments are concerned, between 2012 and 2016, these IGOs classified most of their OER policy instruments as having a major intermediate organizational priority. Um, during this period, they all expanded their activities on disseminating ideas about OER. Right? Um, and this is specifically true following those communications, uh, policy proposals or communications from 2012 onward. Right? And I should also maybe just say that the OECD, there was also a, an intention or there was a proposal for like a stronger instrument in 2011 um, for potentially a declaration or a recommendation on OER, which was not successful. But the positive outcome of that was that it restarted the line of investigation into OER, which then ultimately led to uh, because policymakers were asking for more evidence about some of the claims related to OER, and so that's what then happened. <laughs> and then, um, and then in 2015, that led to the publication of OER Catalyst for, for Innovation. Um, again, and so following the, the, these policy communications in 2012 and 2013, UNESCO and COAL started to, to focus prominently on providing direct uh, policy advice uh, to policymakers around the world on uh, capacity building activities and, and evidence based advocacy. The European Commission focused on applying funding OER policy instruments, technical infrastructure, and research activities. And OECD, as a consequence, as I already mentioned, they, they expanded their activities on. Uh, on, on emanating ideas about OER. So these are some of the similarities and differences as far as, as, far as these organizations are concerned. Now perceived, uh, or thank you, now perceived or observed successes and challenges as far as the successes with the efforts. Um, so here you can look at two different scopes. One is an international scope and then the other one is a national scope, uh, government lawyer policy making processes. So the respondents identified as far as the international scope is concerned, the, the respondents identified their OER policy proposals and declarations in the period between 2011 and 2013 as having as, as managing to set international OER policy agenda. And also it led to additional lines of actions for these IGOs, as I've already mentioned, right? which was a positive uh, development. And in terms of the scope, the national scope, so here, here, here we are talking about the perceived successes of their actions on national policy making processes with respect to OER, right? So here, I'm, so the first example is the agenda setting, uh, which is the first section of the policy cycle. Um, so here again, the, the respondents found that the policy proposals um, and also that the international or regional consultations, forums, and conferences and meetings that they organized, they managed to set national OER policy agenda uh, for policymakers. But the one thing that I should also mention, though, that they could only establish these kinds of successes through inferences to a few national policy texts, where the instruments were referenced or, you know, but that didn't really tell them much. You know, or it was through some sort of anecdotal feedback. And that's why the second part of the research that I told you about as far as those interviews government for your policy makers are concerned are so important to actually see how they perceive the effectiveness of those instruments. And as far as the policy formulation and, and implementation stages are concerned, the, the respective IGOs felt that the, the direct OER policy advice that they provided to different policymakers and the capacity building activities led to the development of national OER policies or support, support implementation processes of of the developed or adopted national OER policies. Right? And then finally, in terms of the um, Launching. Okay, let me try this. Seems like the computer froze. Okay, so I only started five parts two, five parts two, so I still have yeah. 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 There you go, thank you.
Okay, these are the last two slides. I still have 10 minutes left because I'm starting five past two, so I'm still good. Um, and so as far as the successes and challenges, I mean, as far as the challenges are concerned, the perceived challenges with their actions, this could be grouped into different categories of challenges, and they all have like specific outcomes or consequences uh, as they describe them. Right? So here you're looking at organizational mandates, for example, as one challenge, or changing organizational priorities or new emerging trends in education. Right? These are some of the challenges that the policymakers or that the representatives of IGOs described. And the consequences are that they limit the ability of the respective IGOs to adopt legal OER policy instruments, as I've already explained earlier, prescribing policy directions for member states, or they affect the continuation of their work on OER in general. The second group of, um, of challenges are related to lack of data or evidence about the uptake and impact of OER and open education in different countries. So researchers here take note, please, because this is something where there is really a continued need for information for policymakers. And then there are even OER developments in different countries. Um, and so what this, what the consequence of this is really, is that um, IGOs have got lack of clarity about the appropriate OER policy instruments they should apply. Right? That's one. And the second is that it actually requires very nuanced and differentiated approach to policy advice in different countries, which is fine, but it requires resources. It's not something that IGOs always have. And then finally, I think this is nothing new, perhaps, in a way. Uh, those who are familiar with sort of policy work. So changes in governments, bureaucracy, governmental priorities. That was another challenge identified, or misconceptions about copyright, open licenses, infrastructural challenges in different countries, or the lobbying activities by the publishing industry. So all of these need to have their own set, sets of consequences, for example, that the developed OER poli policies were not implemented, or the developed OER policies um, were not addressing OER. <laughs> they are just focusing on the learning activities. <laughs> yeah. And that's about it for now. Thank you very much for your attention. I think we have a few minutes for questions. A lot to digest, I know. Mm -hmm. And you meet Please go ahead. <laughs> so, in the national policies that you looked at, what are some examples of some countries that have, you know, particularly interesting or exemplary national policies? I would be hesitant to say which ones have got the exemplary ones because I was not actually doing analytical work about policies themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm merely looking at the inferences or the role that international organizations and other stakeholders or advocates play on these kinds of processes and in what way they can actually make the processes more effective, you know, right? Yes. But on that note, I'm looking actually, as far as the policy, governmental policy is concerned, I think that it also requires a bit of a more nuanced um, way of talking about policy yeah, because everybody keeps asking, like, what the heck is policy? Like, is, is this policy, is that policy, is funding policy? And I think that looking at it in terms of OER policy instruments is a better way of, of understanding like what, the, what governments are actually doing. Uh, so if you are looking at uh, carrot stick sermons, right? That's, that's, these are all specific policy approaches by, that the governments can take with respect to OER open education more broadly, right? So um, they can prescribe direction in a certain way, they can provide funding for specific activities, uh, they can issue communications, uh, so this would be the sermons. Uh, another example would be, I don't know, the NATO framework, not the military NATO, but um, uh, which is modality instruments, authority instruments, strategy instruments, organization instruments. So when people are looking at policies and trying to analyze them in different countries, I think they should kind of try to take the range of these instruments into account. Um, because I think often people look at like, is there a legislation, which is rare anyway. Um, but as far as like some stronger policy statement, um, you should have a more differentiated approach to how you're looking at these different actions that governments are taking. Right? Um, and I'm, I've, uh, I could probably point you to a lot of examples that are of policies that exist out there that have a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, but of course there are some successful challenges. And actually, Robert and I were speaking about this during lunch break. Um, there are certain governments that keep supporting the movement um, over a sustained period of time through different means. You know, adopting different different policy instruments. Netherlands is one of them. Since 2006 and up to 2013. 
And I think the question there is like, what's going on there? Like, why does the government continues to support OER open education related efforts over such so, so I think these are the kinds of questions we can maybe start to explore um, in terms of when we are looking at successful policy approaches in different countries. I think British Columbia could be another one, I think. Um, right there, government has been providing funding for open education related efforts for a number of years now. So it continues to be on the agenda of policymakers. But I think the question is why. And I think perhaps this is something that we need to start looking at in terms of successful examples, what's working there and why. I think. Well, have you noticed any, maybe, had any correlation between countries that have these policies and countries? where students don't have to buy their own textbooks? No, that's not something that I'm focusing on. So I, I, would, I would refrain from commenting on that type of issues right now. And also like, remember like uh, my geographical spread is really wide and the yeah. policy context is really different from one country to the next, you know? So yes, I know in the US, Canada, the focus is very strong on, on textbooks. In, 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 in other countries, the sort of policy context is quite different. Mm -hmm. And that also requires um, also a different analytical approach, uh, um, discourse analysis and the like. No. These kinds of documents. Which is... I retract my question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> do you see any sort of um, yes. influence on yes. say, the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Is that starting to feed into the, the talk process? In terms of the implementing the direction of policy, you know, I mean, you can have a policy from a social justice perspective or from a business perspective. You can both want OERs, but there's a different underpinning ideology, if you will. Yeah, certainly the sustainable development goals play a role in there. Not, uh, and also the IGOs are contextualizing their actions or justifying the further involvement with this space in the context of sustainable development goals. And where you see new developments, I think in Germany, when you look at the latest OER strategy, for example, I think sustainable development goals are featured within that specific policy document. Um, so uh, I think the overall, maybe just uh, just a parting note that I would like to, to say here is that when we are doing the, this kind of work, when we are trying to convince governments to adopt policies, uh, uh, supportive policies for OER open education, I think it needs to be kind of aligned align with their priorities, the national priorities. It really does require a more of a differentiated and nuanced approach to what we're trying to do. So it's, it's, it's easy to have some model, um, model policy documents, right? And, and that's, that's helpful. But I think that in terms of justifying why government needs to do this, those kinds of that kind of generic arguments like do this because it's the right thing to do, it just doesn't resonate. It's just, it just goes blank, you know? So it does require like a more work on our part also. If, if, whether you are an advocate or whatever your role is, and you're trying to convince your policymaker to do something about it, like just do your homework <laughs> before you start the advo Yeah. Just, just looking at this from an outsider looking in, um, is there any research or information that shows which countries are the champions for um, implementing policies? And would that help? Because the biggest opposition is is the lobbyists against it that are about the, the printing of, of learning materials. And and from an advocate standpoint, from everybody at this gathering, be the lobbyists saying these countries are champions at it, and these ones are excelling, and that would help the politicians want to be in that competitive race to be equal to them and help them push it to the next level. Yeah. Those countries are selling, yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. I think, um, because in many, I think in, in many countries, you know, you do have look at your contracts um, and you know, that's when you filtrate to higher levels. And so it's very difficult to kind of step away from it. But I would say, um, I would maybe ask for a little bit of patience to, to answer your questions, because uh, at this particular moment, as I, as I said earlier, the UNESCO is, uh, UNESCO is embarking on the monitoring process of the UNESCO recommendation. And if you are, I'm not sure if you read the document, but there are five uh, main action areas, right? And one of them is about calling on governments to create supportive policies, uh, or your policies. And so they're actually supposed to also um, report on this action area 
And it's a survey instrument, you know, there are always issues with survey instruments, you know, how reliable they really are and who is filling it and all that. But um, in the next few months, I think we, we could have a fairly good overview of the most recent developments in this regard. Right? So just uh, that's, I, as far as I know, um, that should be presented, the report should be presented to the general conference in October and it should be available shortly afterwards for public consumption. Great. I'm afraid it will have to cap it here, but another round of applause. Oh, I, I forgot to say that the GoGM, uh, just in case you're wondering uh, why the penguins are standing here on the table, <laughs> the Global Your Graduate Network has got the penguins as, as, as the mascot, as the official mascot. So if you see any penguins floating around in the space, the compact space, now you know why. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Over to you. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, today we're um, actually transitioning the conversation a little bit um, towards talking a little bit of like going against the policy, I guess you could say. So um, a different kind of route um, in terms of conversation. Um, so the topic of the conversation is opening up research through self-archiving practices. My name is Nelda Romero Hall, and I am um, currently at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and I am the graduate coordinator of the Learning Design and Technology doctoral program. My co-authors who couldn't be here today are Josh Rosenberg, who is the coordinator of the um, data science program at our institution, and he's also in the learning design space. And uh, last but not least, uh, George Valencianos, uh, who is a full professor at Royal Rhodes um, University in British Columbia, Canada. And he is the Canada Research Chair for Innovative Teaching and Technology. I always like uh, joke with him because I forget his really long title. <laughs> um, so the plan for today is to talk a little bit through the introduction of the topic, um, then um, discuss a little bit of prior research that has been done related to self-archiving and the practices of sharing that um, scholars um, do in education, and then um, discuss a little bit of our work in progress um, research that we have going on. Uh, some of the results that we have had so far, we're still I'm going through the validation process of our um, results. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then just um, having a little bit of feedback and discussion. So I should start by saying that this work was actually um, inspired by um, the work of my co-authors. Um, in 2017, um, George um, did a presentation at a different conference, AECT, and he talked about um, uh, whether researchers make our research available to the public. We are, all three of us um, are in learning design and technology, and um, in this particular case, um, George was talking about how instructional designers, how learning designers rely significantly in the research and scholarship that um, faculty publish, right? And if that um, scholarship is not available or freely available, it just limits their practice. Um, so he did some initial work and was able to find out that 48% uh, of research publics um, was also available to the public. So it was uh, kind of like an initial part of um, the research. Then um, just last year, my colleague, Josh Rosenberg, um, actually proposed um, to the Open Education Conference um, this topic of academic, how academic journals are shared in the open. And it was a very small sample of 50 um, journal articles that he selected randomly and he looked on whether they were available um, openly. Um, and he was able to find that 68% um, were available in their final published form only two were available in their preprint form. He was not able to present this research, which, which we were really shocked, and he wrote a blog post about it. And this is, um, George and I reacted to that blog post, and this is how we, our collaboration sort of got started. So um, overall, um, we can say that policymakers and um, other entities, our um, uh, colleagues in universities are 
constantly encouraging us to search to share our research efforts in a public manner. We have seen um, a significant amount of this when it comes to um, granting or funding agencies. So in the United States, the, one of the biggest uh, funding agencies is the National Science Foundation. There are other big funding agencies in Europe, um, in Canada as well. And one of the biggest part of grant funding is writing your dissemination plans. And a huge part of those dissemination plans is having some sort of open educational resource available for everyone, right? Um, but there are various systemic issues that we are facing in academia that really prevent us to engage into this um, open scholarship practice, right? Um, first of all, uh, we have that um, the issue of focusing on these prestigious journals. Uh, we are always uh, pushed um, as faculty member, I am too, to um, go for that R1 um, or um, I don't know what even whatever it's called um, journal that we have to publish in because that's the criteria that our institution wants for us. Um, and then we may be as scholars in different type of stages. So if I am um, an assistant professor or I'm an associate professor, I'm a full professor, I can make very various determinations as to where I want to publish. Um, if I'm gonna be judged by um, a tenure committee, I have to sort of like rely on what that tenure committee is gonna uh, want from me, right? Um, so that creates some sort of, again, systemic issues for scholars. Um, then there's um, the tenure process and the unequal access to um, open access journals. So um, in some instances, there may be a fee that you have to pay. So for example, AERA, um, the American Educational Research Association, which is uh, one of the biggest um, professional organizations in the United States, has an, um, a journal that's called AERA Open. And their um, publication fee to publish, um, publish OER is um, like $300, $400, right? So where are you gonna get that money to publish in that journal? Um, and that's just one example. There are others that charge even more. Um, so again, issues that challenge whether we want to we publish um, open or not. Um, looking at some of the um, limited literature that we were able to find on this topic, um, we were able to identify um, this publication by Perkins and Lowenthal in 2016 that showed that um, as scholars, we primarily focus on um, the journal that we're going to publish in based on whether uh, what's the aim of the journal. So if you ask any scholar, um, you know, where should I have this, uh, this piece that I published that I want to publish on feminist pedagogy in online learning environments, where should I publish? Um, they're going to tell you, you have to research the journal, you have to look at their aim, and that's how you determine where you're going to publish. Um, but Harley do would say, um, look at the aims of the journal and also consider looking at whether it's going to be open access or it's going to be restricted um, to just individuals who have access to databases. So that moral and ethical concern um, is really not there um, as a main issue for scholars. It's really like a second thought or something that we think about later on. Dissemination and being open is not um, the number one priority. We, um, we see self-archiving as a sort of like a way to um, help mitigate this issue of um, publishing in journals that are uh, restricted, right? Um, so myself, um, George and Josh, all uh, maintain our own websites. And one of the things that we are often told, all three of us, is uh, you're so generous for sharing your work so widely in your websites. Um, but we want to make sure that our um, scholarship is available to all. We want to make sure that um, individuals who do not have access to a database are able to access our work. Um, but 
prior research has been conducted, and I want to um, highlight the fact that this prior research was done in 2010. So it's been quite a long time since this topic has been looked at. It's a touch screen. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's been quite a long time since this um, topic of cell archiving uh, has been looked at. And um, what they were able to determine back in 2010 is that cell archiving was not something that everyone does. Um, um, and in back then, about 20% of scholars practice cell archiving. Um, so I'm curious to know, based on those who are here, how many of you practice self-archiving? Okay, so that's some level there. That's pretty good. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, so with that, we decided to move forward with um, our research, which is, um, again, work in pro progress. So uh, we took some of the work that um, Josh Rosenberg had already started, um, in which he selected 50 um, journal articles on random, and instead, um, using his uh, data science background and R coding and other things, um, we uh, continue to look at the journal articles that are published by um, ARA, which are uh, seven of them, and um, the first one that you see right here is ARA Open, which is the one that's, um, you have to pay a fee, but it's published open to anyone. Um, all others are, are restricted, just access to institutions who pay their fee. Um, what we did um, is that um, there was some, uh, a third party that was involved in the collection of this um, journal articles. Uh, and we looked at, um, we accessed Google Scholar as the main database to look at um, the journal articles. Um, there was some programming that is involved in there. And we used this um, SIR API in order to search Google Scholar and access all the journal articles of all those seven um, journals to determine how many of them were actually available freely um, on the internet um, through Google Scholar. So um, I'm gonna make the slides available, um, but if you want to um, take a look at the code or access to the code, um, Josh has very graciously posted the code in his um, own blog. And the process was actually a little bit painful he would go try the code and then we would meet. Uh, we will look at the um, output that was generated from the code and we would make some determinations of things that were new or random. And then we would go through the coding process again. So uh, what we were able to um, determine was that um, from 2010 to 2022, so we decided to select 2010 because that was at that point where in the literature they had said that 20% of journals, 20% um, of scholars uh, self archive their work. So we selected 2010 and we waited until the very end of 2022. So we ran um, this data earlier this year. Um, we were able to find a total out of 3,055 journal articles. Um, 2,146 were available through serve archiving processes or methods. Um, so a total of 70% of the journals that are published are actually available through serve ar archiving methods. So that from 10, 2010 um, to 2023 has increased tremendously, uh, which shows that scholars are very interested in disseminating their work and sharing it with the public. Um, we were able to determine um, through the code, sorry, let me get through this slide. Uh, we were able to determine through the code um, for each a specific journal, how many articles were available. And we left ARA open um, in there because we were aiming to have out of 539 articles, have 539 articles available. But somewhere there was like a discrepancy there. Uh, we're still kind of working through that. Um, but overall, um, you can see that 
there is like a, a variation in some of the outcomes, um, but not a huge discrepancy based on the different um, journals that are published by ARA. ARA. Um, another important element for us as part of this research was to see if there was a change through the time period. So perhaps we were going to see as you know this number be a little bit smaller here and perhaps grow a trend in growth. Um, but the reality was that there was not really a change through the different years um, throughout number of articles that have been shared have stayed um, pretty similar. Again, not huge discrepancies. Um, we also thought that maybe in the year 2022, um, we were not going to see that many articles that were going to be shared because it's such a recent year, but that didn't hold. Again, um, articles were shared widely. Um, and then we looked at specifically at where people are server archiving their uh, research. And um, of course, ResearchGate is right at the top. Um, and, um, then we also saw quite a few publications through um, SagePub, um, academia.edu, although we were uh, we had quite a few issues with academia.edu. We were not sure if it was because neither of us, uh, none of us um, have an academia.edu account or there was some other issue with it, but maybe that could be it. Um, and then this were the remainder of the um, sites where individuals were self archiving their work. I changed my vote. Sorry? You said self archiving, I thought you meant having your own website. Well, um, sorry, I don't have where I use research gate. Do you, you call that self archiving? Yes, oh, absolutely. Sorry, I didn't understand. Then. Sorry. Yeah, so self archiving really is any practice that allows you as an individual to search or um, share your own work, whether it would be your own website or you know, using a different tool like research gate or others. Yeah, I misunderstood. I thought you meant literally self, you had your own website. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate so, you. I don't suspect more people may have put up their hand. Okay. Uh, how many of you? No, I'm curious to know how many of you use ResearchGate. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. I appreciate you. Or academia.edu. Okay. That's why it's shared. So, so no, that's why I suspect quite a few people might have. No, I appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you. So, um. In order to determine whether our programming was actually working the way we want it to work, uh, we engage in a validation process of a hundred links because, of course, we can, you know, do the programming, um, share the results, but is it really the output that we want, or um, is there something else that it could be giving us? So. Um, for the validation process, um, out of those 3,000 plus articles um, that we were able to gather, we engage in a validation process of 100 links, randomly selected. Um, and that actually helped engage um, the assistance of our research assistants. Um, so we, uh, we did the validation comparison of the manual URLs, and I'm gonna show you the spreadsheet here in a minute. Um, so, literally someone entering in Google Scholar the uh, name of the article, do we get the exact same websites? Um, and then we also did the validation to check what was behind those websites. Are we really being taken to a PDF of um, the final version of the journal or um, you know, a preprint of the journal, right? Um, can I switch in between? I can, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is the output that we get through the programming um, that's done of um, Google Scholar, so running the program uh, through Google Scholar. And here we have um, 
uh, source of where, is com where we're getting this article from, um, the format, um, the link, um, the original link that we're getting through the programming. Thank you. Um, then we have the manual coding that uh, was actually done by my graduate assistant, Danny. Um, sorry, the manual uh, looked uh, search in Google Scholar, um, the article name, and then the journal, the year, and then we take notes on whatever happens when we do that manual search. Let me go back to... Okay. So through that validation process, um, we were able to determine in the manual search of Google Scholar that there was a 69% match uh, between what the uh, we that when we ran the code versus the manual search on Google Scholar, 31% um, were not um, the direct match. But what we found is that. Um, eight of them were actually a direct um, download li link. So the link that was in the spreadsheet is unlikely to ever match because it's the download link to whoever's using whatever computer, right? Um, and then in the actual search of what is behind the link, are, the, are we actually getting the journal articles? Um, the, all the links that were looked at were for ARA open, so we were expecting 100% to find a link to the actual uh, journal article. Um, uh, seven of them were um, academia.edu links, and they just provided an error when we looked behind the article. One um, was view at CTU, which we're not 100% sure what that stands for, but it also did not provide an article. And uh, one led to a PDF, but that PDF was actually like a plan for the research study. It was not actual the actual research study or the actual publication. Uh, so in total, uh, nine of them uh, we were not able to find the paper for um, the final version of the article. So overall, in conclusion, we have found that from 2010 up until now. Um, the practice of self-archiving is increasing tremendously. Um, looking back at, um, you know, the percentage from 2010 to 70% of scholars trying to disseminate and make their research available to others, um, we find that to be um, something to, um, to be proud of as a community of scholars. We're trying to make the public aware of research. And that is tremendously important, giving um, all the issues that we have with misinformation and um, and other things that are happening in our happening in our political environment. Um, questions um, that I want to leave you with is: um, Do we continue publishing in closed journals and using surf archiving as a workaround? Do we really want to continue doing that, um, or do we publish in open journals without no need for um, doing this workaround? Um, and we don't really have an answer to it. Um, those are just questions that we are currently kind of reflecting on as we think about writing this for publication in an open access journal. <laughs> um, here's our contact information. Um, again, my name is Enilda Romero Hall, and my colleagues are Josh Rosenberg and Josh Valenciano. So, Thank you so much for having me here today, and I'm open to any questions or comments that you may have for me. Yes. I'm Kathy Esselin. I followed your work with ACT for a while and I appreciated it so much. I'm a librarian, academic librarian, and these conversations are actually happening a lot of places in librarianship, and there's a lot of uh, contemporary research that's been accomplished. Well, and you're experiencing the same thing in distance education, Scholarship is people are coming up and saying, oh, now online learning is starting. You're like, oh, no, thank you. But, um, so I, and any of you that are fascinated by what she's saying, if you'll connect with your scholarly communications librarian at your institution, so it's like, here's my be Rachel Caldwell. Has she worked with you on this at all? No, Rachel, no. Okay, because they, they are all over it, the Scholcom people, and they, they're going to have the resources and be able to point you to uh, really the sweet spot on the literature. And what you might be looking for is um, scholarly communications. Mm -hmm. The librarianship keyword to drop in there to increase how much literature and they've also will have resources that will help uh, 
really even optimize your search uh, on paywall.com and stuff as you're trying to find things that are accessible. They will also point you towards your institutional repositories. And I don't know if that came up at all. But no, well, one of the things that we have struggled with is doing the search while we are in our systems. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard to be completely disconnected from our system. So when we get in meetings, we're like, well, you try it, you try it, you try it, because we may not be in the system. Yeah, your library, your library can sit down with you and help you square that away. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Yes. Sorry, as a follow on, as another librarian or resources li librarian here, I suspect the answer, part of the answer to your second question is that it's all about money. Um, um, Tom was to mentioned it yesterday, which is true, that there's nothing really free, you know, and um, I think self, you're going to find that some institutions can afford to publish in open access because they can afford to pay the processing yeah. charges. Some institutions can't afford it. You know, and um, their authors and their authors can't afford it out money out of the grants. And so this is the difficulty that we have. There's an inequity there between those institutions that have large amounts of money and they can afford to do this for funding. And journal articles are minuscule in cost in terms of what's happened to monographs. Yeah. Um, and that is part of the answer. It's not the whole answer to your question, but it's part of it, which is why I'm pleased to see that your researchers are doing the self-archiving process, because it's very much a route that makes it more affordable for them and for their institutions. So that's great. Thank you. Yes, the, and uh, the money yeah, always comes back. Sorry, the question always comes back to money, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. I think we have time for one more question, but then we'll have to. Thanks, Phil Johnson, retired academic, and uh, came up against this when I could decoupled from the institution. I couldn't get things anymore. And I felt as if I'd been thrown out of the gang. Uh, so, well, seriously, I'm, I love the idea that people are increasingly active in making this stuff available to anybody that wants it. Uh, and it strikes me a very instigated take on that. Other people's 